album. Good morning. Welcome into worship this morning, this beautiful Pentecost day when we celebrate the inrush of the Holy Spirit on the birth of the church movement. A few announcements as we begin uh, worship today. Um, aside from the Strawberry Festival that's coming up, of course, as we've been announcing all along. Uh, here in the back, uh, we have um, the fundraiser for the preschool. They're selling popcorn, candles, and uh, whatever else in the background form. It looks really uh, tasty and yummy. Uh, all of it, except the candles, they look pretty and will probably smell nice. Um, anyway, uh, they're doing the fundraiser to uh, raise some funds to purchase some new playground equipment uh, here. And so, uh, if you have a chance, uh, if you haven't already, after service, stop in the back narthex there and uh, take a look at uh, that form and see how you can support uh, them as well. But we have had that also in the newsletter the last couple weeks. There's an online website, so if you prefer to go there uh, this week, you can uh, find that information in the newsletter. Last week, we had somebody leave their glasses in uh, worship. Uh, so if you know of somebody who's missing their glasses, uh, please let us know. Uh, I'm surprised nobody's called to claim them and just wonder where they work because uh, they look like they are probably needed. Uh, our eye expert, uh, Jamie, is here today, so he'll know if you're lying, if you're missing your glasses. So, uh, <laughs> also, I wanted to share uh, one quick prayer update for uh, Taylor, uh, whom we've been praying for uh, for many months now, as he's been dealing with so many health concerns. Uh, he had had, he's developed an infection. And that uh, led to his most recent hospital stay and, and some surgeries since they were trying to fight this infection. And the doctors have finally gotten to the point where the particular infection he has, they're not able to treat. And this has led him uh, to return to the uh, home in, in Canton, uh, where he is now again at Sunset. Uh, uh, that's the, uh, yeah. Um, and he's dealing with a lot of what it means to be with a diagnosis that's not curable. And so uh, lots of prayers are needed for, for Taylor and his mom as uh, she continues to struggle with what that means for her as well. And uh, we don't, there's no timeline for how long this infection is going to you know, run its course and do what it's going to ultimately do for him. Um, but it, it's gonna be painful, unfortunately, because that's how the infection works. So. Uh, please keep Taylor uh, in your daily prayers that he has the peace of God through this time and strength and courage and faith from God to, to fight through this all the way to the end uh, whenever that will come for him. It's going to be a, a long road, I'm sure, but uh, uh, it's going to be a time that lots of prayers are needed. So thank you for praying for him and, and his mom, Janet. As we head into uh, June, uh, our, our next vision and purpose is going to be for uh, Lutheran Social Services of Illinois. And uh, that's a great organization that deals with so many uh, social needs. And I'll be publishing some more information about it throughout our, uh, our newsletters uh, that we print here in June. Uh, we're going to cut back to two a month here because there's not a lot going on June, July. So there'll be a couple of them here in June and a couple in July that we'll send out. Um, and so. Uh, when we do, I'll have some more information about what LSSI does. It's, of course, uh, one, an organization that goes back a long time here in Illinois, dealing with adoption and foster care and, and also so many other social needs. So all support for LSSI will be greatly appreciated. As I said, today's Pentecost Sunday. It's that day that Holy Spirit rushes in and livens our faith again. And so we will receive that uh, today, and as we enter into worship now, we listen to the prelude music that will draw us into a great spirit of joy and worship today.
refresh this morning with a moment of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's take a moment now to share a sign of God's peace. Our opening hymn this morning is, O Day Full of Grace.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord.
But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who walks, who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. A reading from Psalm 104. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there, living things both small and great. There go the ships and the leviathan that you formed to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing, raise to my God while I have been. May my med meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Corinthians chapter 12. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, Let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifest manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of powerful deeds, to another prophecy, to another the dis discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. 
Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And he had said this, he breathed on them, and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. I'm going to tell a couple stories on myself. I don't want it to be perceived as if this is really how bad of a driver I am, though. Several months back, I was driving back from Galesburg later in the day, family in the car with me. She had a cop car going the other way. And all of a sudden, he's crossing the median and pulls across and flips the lights on and pulls me over. He tells me the speed he clocks me on. I said, I couldn't have been going that fast, sir. He cited as proof that I was speeding, that I hit the brakes as soon as I saw him go by the other way. I said, yeah, but sir, I always hit the brakes when I see a cop car. I could be doing 20 and a 35, a cop car goes the other way, I hit the brakes. It's just like this built-in response that I have. He still gave me the ticket. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know why I have this guilt reaction when I see a police officer. I don't really have a reason for it. Again, it doesn't matter if I'm driving fast, and I will admit I do have a little bit of lead here in my right foot. It can be a little on the heavy side sometimes. And no, I don't always agree with the police officer with how fast I'm going when he says so. But there's just this sense of guilt that comes with seeing a police officer drive by the other way like I'm being watched. It's not really about me, but... It's just a sense I have. Even when I don't get a ticket, many, many years ago, I mean, my little, my two kids, I didn't even have a trace at the time. I had two kids who were living in Indiana at the time. Uh, we were driving, I picked them up, they were spending a week with the grandparents when I was bringing them home, and uh, not too far from home, a police officer pulls me over. I think I got out of the ticket because it was my birthday. <laughs> and because the kids were properly buckled in. Uh, they had the child seats at the time. They were small enough to need those things, and they were properly buckled in. And even this police officer who was being so nice and just out saying, you know, we're just slowing traffic down, and, and I didn't think I was going that fast, and he didn't think I was going that fast, but it was just enough. Oh, okay, fine. But even in that moment, my own guilt and my own shame of being pulled over with the kids in the back, even as nice as this trooper was, he came back from his car and he had these little goodie bags, stickers, coloring books, crayons, I think lollipops, all these things for the kids. Pencils. Hey, you guys are so great back here, being so good for your dad and so nice and well buckled in. Sir, you really have to slow down a lot now. Guys, have a great day back here. <laughs> Nice police officer, but even then it had this, this element of, there, 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 I'm watching you. I want to translate that kind of feeling into something that Jesus says today about the life of the church. Jesus says to his disciples on that first night of Easter, that's when the story takes place. It's the very first Easter day that morning. The women were at the tomb. Peter ran to the tomb. It's empty. Mary Magdalene saw Jesus. The men walking out to Emmaus will experience Jesus before uh, they run back to tell him they did. Now Jesus is appearing to uh, ten. We'll find out later in the story. Thomas is with him. So ten of the disciples are gathered in this room at this moment. And he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. And he says to them, if you retain the sins of any, they are retained them. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Throughout history, the church, the 
big capital C global entity that is the church has taken these words as permission to be the sin police in the world. And many times throughout the history of the church, they have leaned more heavily on that retaining of the sins than they have on the forgiving of the sins. And what this leads to is a feeling of guilt and shame, even by those who may not think they should feel guilt or shame. The sense that someone is always watching them and that someone is the church, is God in that building over there watching them. They feel like when they go by a church, they've got to slow down. We see this in lighthearted moments. The other morning I was working with someone here in the office and to, to save her uh, embarrassment, I won't say who it was, but uh, there was some work happening and uh, in the middle of it, the person accidentally let out a, a curse word. Shucks. Darn. Shoot. Uh, a little bit more strong than that probably, but then came the apology. Oh, pastor, I shouldn't have said that. I'm in the church. Oh, pastor, I'm in the pastor's presence. I shouldn't have said that. That's a lighthearted moment where we feel like we're being watched, right? Where God is going to smite us if we've said the wrong thing. My response was, well, if, if you think that's bad, just don't sit with me while I'm watching a hockey game because, oh, <clears throat> my children will tell you exactly what kind of language comes out of my mouth during a hockey game. But we feel this. <coughs> And if that's a lighthearted moment, that generally we kind of understand and know. Imagine what it must be like for someone who for centuries belongs to an identity that has been told your sins are retained because we, the church, say so. This is what many people feel. A heavy weightedness that the church is out to get them. That they aren't welcome in the church. And this is a cultural issue that we as a small congregation, the tiniest of peace within the global entity that is the church, has to deal with and reckon with as we serve as church here in our own community. How do we, as congregation, up against this massive cultural experience, help people experience the spirit of newness of life through this gift of the forgiveness of sins? How do we, as congregation up against this massive cultural understanding of church fight against this sense that sins have to be retained because that's what the global institution of church has historically done. We've said these sins must be retained. Well, it's Pentecost Sunday. It's that day the Spirit breathes newness into us and reminds us the gift that we have to forgive sins and to welcome people in and to release them from the guilt and the shame and the weight of all of that pain that sits on them because culture says it must stay with them. We have the gift to release people from all of that. And if we want to know what it looks like, all we have to do is go back through the Gospels. This story comes from the Gospel of John, so let's take a look at just a couple of quick stories in John's Gospel to see how Jesus releases people. Earlier in John chapter 3, a Pharisee, a 
man beholden to strict interpretation of the law. Very strict interpretation of what sins get retained and what sins get forgiven and how those sins get retained and how those sins get forgiven. He comes to Jesus by night. Partly out of his own fear, his own shame, his own feeling of guilt of approaching one who represents God, one whom he knows is a prophet. He comes at night and is released. He's offered new birth. Even when he doesn't understand it, his own wisdom can't comprehend what this means. His own lifetime of studying the Word of God can't comprehend that what this newness looks like, and yet Jesus releases him from the need for his wisdom to comprehend it, and offers him new birth, the spirit that frees him from all that blocked him in. Shortly after that, Jesus will encounter a woman at a well. Today we don't think much about how men and women interact because it's just normal and commonplace in Jesus' day and age. An interaction between a male and a woman who is not his wife would have been taboo. So right there, Jesus is crossing some major boundaries. This woman is also not Jewish. That actually comes up in their conversation. They talk about their differences of how they worship God, how they identify as believers in God, and the various differences and Jesus breaks taboo number two by speaking with someone who is uh, worshiping God in a completely non-Jewish way. And then he breaks another taboo. This woman has had five husbands and the one she's living with right now isn't even her husband and still Jesus releases her from all the pain, the weight, the guilt, and the shame and gives her the living water, welcoming her with joy into his presence and into the kingdom he is ushering into the world. Without a single word of condemnation towards anything that's transpired in her life. Jesus will go on to feed a multitude of people. Thousands. Men were counted at 5,000. So you add in women who are wives, you add in children who are there, you add in people who aren't married. Uh, you know, the, the, it, it's amazing how many people are there. You've got people who are Jewish, people who are not Jewish. You've got people who are sinners by the law, by what Pharisees would call the law. You've got people who don't even know who God is. They just hear a preacher sharing some good words and they want to know more about what he's got to say. They get hungry. And Jesus says, let's feed them. It's time to feed them. We don't have any food. The disciples say, oh, well, this boy has some. Jesus says, bring it here. Now feed them. Thousands upon thousands of people Worthy, unworthy, merited, unmerited, didn't matter. Jesus didn't sit there with his clipboard and say, okay, that group of people over there, nope. Uh, this group of people here, eh, half of them get it, half of them don't. Hey, no, no clipboard, just give them food. Welcome them into the kingdom. A few chapters after that, a blind man, born blind, born into a condition of not being able to see. A condition which, uh, in ancient times, was considered to be a sign of sin, a sign that somehow you did something wrong to offend God, that you are not whole, because having all your senses meant being whole, and having one of your senses broken meant you're unwhole, and if you're unwhole, you're broken, you're unworthy to be in God's presence. Question came up, who sinned Jesus, this man or his parents, that he was born in this state of brokenness? And Jesus releases not only the blind, but all who are hearing him 
of that sense of judgment by saying no one's sinned. All right, so his eyes don't work like yours work. Why does that make him a sinner? Why does that mean he's broken? Why does that mean he's unholy? Why does that mean he can't be in God's presence? All right, we're going to show God's glory right now so you understand how God's glory works. And he restored his sight, restored him to wholeness by the community standards of the day, and restored him to be his presence within God's kingdom by making him whole. He didn't have to do that, but he wanted to say to those around him, all you have to do is welcome him in. Without his sight, with his sight, it doesn't matter. Just welcome him in. He's part of the kingdom. He's a beloved child of God. No condemnation. This is the gift that Jesus is giving to us. Yeah, Jesus says, if you retain the sins of any, sure, they'll be retained. You want to keep somebody outside of the club? Hey, that's on you, and it's going to hurt you for doing so. But you have the ability to forgive. You have the ability to draw in, to welcome into this kingdom. You have the gift of telling people who have heard throughout their lifetimes and throughout the ages of people like them that they are excluded. You have the gift to say, no, you really do belong in this kingdom. The most famous verse in John's Gospel is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that all who believe in him may not perish, but may have everlasting life. The second verse to that continues, John 3.17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but in order to save it. So this gift that we've been given on this Pentecost Sunday of retaining sins or forgiving sins comes down to this. If God didn't send Jesus, his own Son, into the world to condemn it, he sure did not send any of us into the world to condemn it. If God sent His Son into the world in order to save it, if God sent His Son into the world in order to draw people into the kingdom, in order to bring them the joy and the peace of knowing our loving God, then surely He sent us, His disciples, into the world to draw others into this kingdom into the presence of a loving God, into the joy of knowing for the fullness and the wholeness of community. Not because our bodies all align the same, not because our orientations of life align all the same, not because we all dress the same or follow the right traditions the same or subscribe to the law the same, but because we are all beloved children of God, first and foremost. And in a world where people are used to feeling condemned, feeling looked down on, feeling guilt just because the presence of the church or just because some people proclaiming to be the church are out there bashing their way of living. That kind of lifestyle, that kind of being church, ultimately is just going to hurt the church. The gift we have is the gift of releasing those from their sins. Releasing those from the sins we have foisted upon them. Releasing those of sins they live within. Releasing them from the pain and the guilt of things that weigh heavily on them. And just welcoming them into the joy of this kingdom. It's tough work. Because we who proclaim a message of forgiveness and welcome into God's kingdom are up against a culture that is filled constantly with the message of beating down, of condemnation, of exclusion. That's what makes it different. That's what makes the church and the gift of the Spirit different. May we, 
be grabbed by the spirit that blows in and through us today. And we experience the trueness of the forgiveness of our sins that release us into the joy of God's kingdom. And then, just as those disciples on the first Pentecost day, I mean, we go out there speaking in all sorts of languages, all the ways that others will hear it, and we tell them the message. There's a place where they're welcome and loved and included. For that is the gift that we have in Jesus. Amen. But just as we sing our hymn of the day, Spirit of Gentleness.
By the Holy Spirit, we have been stirred from our placidness, and now we confess our faith using these words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Passionist God, you send your spirit through the gifts of fire, wind, and word. As you equip the disciples for their work, equip us to bring the good news to all those who long for you. Hear us, O oh God. Restoring God, wind and flame bring life and destruction throughout the world. We pray for those who work with wind energy, for migratory birds, for protection for lands facing destructive fire, <clears throat> for forester managers and firefighters. Renew the face of the earth. Hear us, O oh God. Ever-present God, your spirit embraces all. Send your spirit of understanding to immigrants, refugees, and any experiencing language barriers. Bless the work of translators, ESL teachers, ambassadors, and international peace organizations. Safely guide those fleeing war and danger. Hear us, O oh God. Merciful God, you anoint us with your spirit. Bless nurses, doctors, midwives, chaplains, counselors, and hospice workers as they care for those in need. We pray for all who seek your comfort, especially Linda, Dave, Cassie and family, Amber and family, Pat, Isla, Carolyn, Tad, Kathy, Dolores, Kathy, Taylor, Erica, Linda, Evelyn, Gary, Dean, and Eloise. Hear us, O oh God. Generous God, you impart a variety of gifts. Set aflame the desire to learn from one another, especially those who differ from us. Make your presence known through missionaries, peace workers, and through the outreach ministries of our center and community. Hear us, O oh God. Life-giving God, we give thanks for those who have died to new life in you. As we observe Memorial Day, we remember those who died in military service. Comfort all who mourn and usher in a world where war is no more. Hear us, O oh God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayer and praise to you, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. And now for offerings gathered through many in various ways, given with the spirit of joy and thankfulness, we pray. Generous God, in this meal, you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of the earth. In the breaking of the bread, reveal to us the risen one. In the pouring of this wine, pour us out in the service to the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing our offering hymn, What Feast of Love, verses 1 and 3.
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so of Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
prepared for us by our Lord. Come, receive his gifts. Let us pray. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your word and this meal of grace, you have nourished our life together. Strengthen us to show your love and serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We stand as we sing our closing hymn, God of Tempest, God of World. <laughs>